What's happening? Uh, we are living in a very exciting time. You know, and perhaps you're observing probably the third industrial revolution because we're observing this rise of machines that are promising to redefine our experiences with everything what we do. This phenomena some people call Internet of Things, some people call Internet of Everything, and more recently, people started calling it automation of everything. Whatever it, the terminology is, what it really means is that we are going to see a different kind of world in very uh, few years' time. This particular talk is more about the human aspect of that world. I'm not going to talk about the technology per se. There are a lot of brilliant developers here, and you have been talking a lot about how different software technologies will really provide the facilitation for that world. I'm going to take it a little bit more on the user, user side of the story, that what sort of human experiences that you can design or develop when this is becoming a reality. So to start with, you know that we heard every other day a new product is being now connected. You go to Kickstarter, you will probably find 100 or 200 or even you know, 500 projects who are trying to create another connected things. They want to create every single thing that we own or we have in our everyday life connected to the internet. That's very nice. You know, it's, it's, it still remains to be seen that how they become useful, but it's good. Now, I have two questions to you to start with. My first question is, when I ask you, what is internet? What would be your answer? You're not going to tell me, I'm certain, you're not going to tell me about bits and bytes and the routers and the TCP IP protocols or HTTP or HTTPS. You guys will talk because you speak a different language, but the majority of the people, the normal people, I mean, sorry, <laughs> the normal people will not answer the internet is bits and bytes. They really will talk about the experiences they have with Facebooks, the LinkedIn's, the Twitters, you know, the Googles, right? If you take Googles out of people's life, I think it's hard now these days to live, survive, right? So my first question to you is, what would be the human experience when we will have a fully connected world? comparable to what is Google, LinkedIn, Facebook today. Think about it when you are designing new softwares or thinking about new products or thinking about new uh, systems. Just think about it. What the world will look like in about 10 years time when everything gets connected. Because right now, we are mainly talking about connectivity and scale. We are just thinking about how to connect things, how to scale them up to billions and millions and so on and so on. If you look into all this prediction coming out from all this industry market research, they're only talking about how many billions of devices will be connected by 2020, 2025, or so on and so on. They really don't talk about what would happen once you have that connectivity achieved. So I think it's a good time to start the discussion, you know, like what human experience will be designed. So to get, get to my second question, I want to you know, talk a little bit about the history of IT or history of computer science in general. So if you look into the way we have uh, uh, experienced the devices in the last uh, uh, couple of decades is quite interesting. In 1980s, personal computer entered our life and tried to you know, like help us in mundane computational tasks. Yesterday I was listening to this very interesting talk uh, from uh, one of the young uh, ladies where she was talking that in 1930s computers were the actual female ladies, right? I mean, they were computing for us. But okay, in 1980s it was the personal computer was doing the compute tasks. And then in 90s, you know, like laptops arrived, you know, people started using notebooks. In 2000s, you know, smartphones started um, you know, invading our life iPads came, and now in this 2015, 2014, we are really, really uh, looking ahead for wearables. You know, we have started wearing glasses, so watches, and so on. We, we expect that this trend will go on. Now, my question is, related to my first one, if everything gets connected, really, if everything gets connected, do you need, a, as a human, to have a connectivity device? Because everything else is connected, right? So it should seamlessly work for you. I have, I have another question. Do the devices need us? <laughs> Probably no. 
uh, we have to uh, maybe you know we, that's another discussion that you can have after uh, after the talk about this industry, how the industry or enterprise would look like in ten years' time. You know, uh, I worry about a lot of jobs, including mine. You know, in ten years' time. But okay, that's a different discussion that your, we could your have. Your job will be safe. It will just be done by a computer. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, Going back to my question that uh, perhaps you would say, you would argue that for certain tasks, for example, personal entertainment, the music that Chris was listening and I was entertaining us 10 minutes ago, you would probably need a personal entertainment device for you. Or you would probably need a phone, the traditional phone, or sort of like a voice or text communication services to communicate with your friends and families, to your mothers, to your, you know, uh, to your friends. But for the rest of the communication or for the rest of the task that uh, you do in your everyday life is probably going, not more going to be needed any longer in that particular connected world. And in fact, that is already happening. How many of you are familiar with Nest? It's, it's nice. Um, um, it's, it's a learning thermostat that promises to cut your energy bill by half. And it does that pretty well, to be honest. Those of you who own it, you probably know that it's actually quite good in that. But the fascinating part of it is that it doesn't require you to do anything, literally. There is a little deployment effort, yes, but once you put it up, it automatically learns your behavior, the occupant's behavior in the home, and then it automatically creates rules and sort of like a automation um, flows on behalf of its users. What we're really observing here, that we are really, really moving towards this that I call zero UI or zero interactions. You won't need any more interaction because to some extent, you would be sort of like understood by this connected world and this connectivity or this connected devices will try to take actions on your behalf in a much more personalized way. And Nest is a brilliant example of how the world will look like. And they're doing a very good job right now. Um, you might argue, those of you uh, who are a bit you know, on the, um, in the, in the Y generations, that isn't it the vision of artificial intelligence was in 1980s? that we will have this super intelligent, uh, you know, like uh, computer agents that would do all these things for us? Yes, indeed. In fact, um, if you go to YouTube and you search for the smart home, first smart home you'll reach or you'll probably end up in a video by Ken Sakamura, a Japanese professor at the University of Tokyo, and he will take you to a journey of his home in 1980s. And you'd be amazed that 35 years ago, 35 years ago, the smart home that he envisioned or he showed is pretty much the same smart home that all this Kickstarter projects talks about. Maybe the UI looks a little bit fancy, you know, it's a little bit, you have a bit more colorful or maybe a little bit more uh, animations or transitions a little bit there or it looks a little bit fancy form factor wise, Apple effect, you know. But in reality, the functionalities or the feature sets are fundamentally the same. The question is, 35 years has passed, I can guarantee that none of you here in this room lives in a smart home. Forget about smart city or a smart enterprise or you know, smart hospitals or whatever. None of you here lives in a smart home. Why? Didn't we do our job well in the last 35 years? I think we did a very good job. We did as researchers, engineers, developers, we did pretty well, you know, that's why we're here today. But the problem was not necessarily the technology itself. The problem was in that vision there was a fundamental dependency on the sensor infrastructure. There was a fundamental dependency that the whole world would be instrumented by additional sensor infrastructure, maybe a camera network or other sort of sensors which would allow us to be monitored and to be understood by sort of like the sensor network to design those services. But the problem is additional infrastructure is expensive. The deployment cost is not 
very low, and then there is a management cost, troubleshooting costs. You can't change your home tomorrow that you own for the last 20 years. Let's make a smart home tomorrow, bam. No, it's not going to happen like this. Technology doesn't enter our life in a direct fashion. It, loves, it, you know, it enters in a piecemeal fashion, as I was telling you about how the computers came into our lives. That particular reason that the cost of sensing infrastructure to be deployed, to be managed, actually was a primary bottleneck for this sort of like the slowness in this technology to become more pervasive. A lot of people call Internet of Things and blah, blah, blah stuff. I've been in the field for many years. I can tell you that what we're doing now, what at least industry is picking up and talking about, things were there like 15 years ago. You know, just go and look the literature, you'll find it. But the problem was the infrastructure cost, and that's why all these projects were always being done in a small university lab or in a small you know, uh, labs in IBM or in, uh, you know, in Microsoft. It never really get out of there, simply because of the cost. Now, luckily, not because I'm coming from Bell Labs, but logically speaking, there is one infrastructure that is globally covered, that is ubiquitously available around us. And that is the wireless network. There are different forms of wireless network. In this particular case, I'm talking about Wi-Fi. Think about Wi-Fi is literally everywhere now in a sort of like a modern Western world. And it is going to be everywhere soon. Regardless which part of the city, which part of the building, where you are, you pretty much are always connected. Now the question is, the Wi-Fi infrastructure or the wireless infrastructure per se was not designed as a sensing fabric. It was created as a communication fabric. It was created as a communication infrastructure. So it was not designed to support you, sort of the you know, sensing requirement that you have. Right? The thesis that I put forward and that we've been working in, in the labs is that how much leverage you can take out of this existing Wi-Fi infrastructure that is already available, deployed and managed by thousands of operators over the world for our sensing tasks. And can you actually replicate all these visions that you had by sensors by using the wireless infrastructure? And that is the fundamental thesis that me and my team in Bell Labs around the world is looking at to what extent we could leverage existing wireless network as a key sensing fabric for a connected world. And then you know, the next thing is that given that we could actually extract sensing information, we could extract behavioral features or sort of like a data out of this wireless network about humans, how much behavior we can extract out of it, high level behaviors. Um, so in this particular talk today, uh, I'm going to really take you through three different projects where I'll try to show you that this is not really you know, a radical sort of like a statement that I'm really, really proposing here that we do not need any more sensors. We live in a sensorless world, no. What I'm really talking about that we there is another way of looking at this automated life that we have been envisioning for a while from a wireless sense a wireless network lens. So let me talk about three projects in the uh, labs that we have done in the last past uh, couple of few years. The very first one will talk about people to content interaction, and I will try to show you that how a network helps to optimize your experience. The second one would be people to object interaction. And the third one would be more about people to um, people interaction, which would be quite exciting, I'm pretty sure. So let me start, go to the people to content interaction. From now on, I'm going to be a little bit more technical, but still not as technical as you guys were presenting yesterday. So there won't be any codes or anything, but still it would be technical. Um, intentionally, I will not go deep in the technology discussions. If you have questions or if you have really you want to understand how we do these things, please follow me up after the talk. You know, I will explain or you know, I'll try to give you the right pointers. Push notifications. I think everybody here, this particular community, is are very familiar with push notifications, right? Push notification is indeed becoming the primary form of interaction in uh, many applications these days, right? And 
how much or whatever it was for the mobile devices, for the wearable world, it is the only type of interactions, right? So, bam, you know, you receive a push notifications every now and then. The problem is that there are hosts of applications, thousands of applications that sends you push notifications these days. You know, it's not like one or two applications that sends you. What it really means from an end user point of view that you, it's very distracting. You know, you always feel like, come on, you know, there is another ping, 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 your push notification are being pushed one after another. So often what people do, that people try to clear everything, you know, like a, uh, without actually looking into the uh, important ones too, sometimes. So that's one problem, that we need to think about how push notification can be well designed. And the second thing is that I don't know if, how many of you actually worked with push notification technologies here? Right, good. Not much, but okay. The other thing is that push notification is a battery killer in your phone. So the people who work on it, they know. And I, I really love this chart, you know, like a, which is basically an augmented version of Maslow's uh, need of uh, hierarchy of human needs. Um, the, the last two layers is actually quite interesting. I talked about a little bit about the network need, but the last bit is really, really important, the batteries. You know, without batteries, your life is literally useless these days, right? So, indeed, we, we need to think about the batteries a lot these days. The problem is, if you understand or if you know how push notification works, push notification is really a battery-hungry technology. The reason being, most of the push notification, for example, in case of Apple, is only delivered over cellular connectivity. For Google or other platforms, they, they switch between the Wi-Fi and the cellular connectivity, depending on which uh, you know, like a, um, connections you have. But push notifications are predominantly very small amount of data, you know, like a really, really small amount of data. So those of you who are familiar with the radio technologies, you know that your cell phone has a radio chip that goes in power on and off mode depending on the, whether the data traffic is coming or not. I'm not going to explain how mobile push notification works because I think for this audience this is obvious by looking at that flow chart, but just looking at, I'll, I'll just try to explain this little chart here. What happens is that whenever you receive a small data, if your phone is slipping, you know, it goes high in the power mode in, in, you know, like to, to accept the data or to receive that data. But once the transmission or reception is finished, it does not go into the low power mode immediately. It anticipates that a little bit more data would come from other sort of communication. This is how at least the radio engineers design these protocols. And, and it stays in that you know, high power state for a while, anticipating that new data would arrive, which is called the little tail time. And then if no data is being seen, then you know, it goes into the low power mode again. And that particular waiting time is called tail time, right? That anticipating when new traffic would come. Believe it or not, this, uh, this tail time is a massive killer of your battery. In fact, 63% of your battery life goes into that tail time, right? Now think about the people who receive thousands of notifications, well, thousand may be a big number, but there is a still user we know from our data sets or from our uh, you know, user bases. Uh, but in generally, people receive 300, 200, or 300 notifications. And they are network notifications, not the local notifications. And that causes dramatic effect on their devices. But the funny part is, if you look into this flow chart, that everything happens here, from the push notification server to third party content provider to the uh, mobile apps. Unfortunately, the entire, in the entire picture, the network is missing. There is no actual network being involved in the entire process. And uh, the whole story for us is that can we actually bring the network into this entire picture and can see that what we could, how could we optimize these content interactions? Because it is only the network or it is only the operator who knows the set of your radios. Apple doesn't know or you know, Google Cloud messaging service do not know. But operators, whoever is providing the 3G cellular connectivity, they know the radio state of your devices. So it could be possible that if we bring them in into this picture, there might be a chance of optimizing your uh, content experience. That's precisely what we did. We created a 
learning technique, a learning algorithm that models network behavior of individuals in a personalized way. So we try to model the network behavior of your phone usage over time. I'm not going to the detail of the algorithm, but it basically looks into the past history and applies some techniques, sort of like it to predict what would be your next network activities in the coming slots, minute at the minute granularity, two minute, three minute, five minutes granularity. And if when notification arrives, if there is an sort of like anticipation that you know you will initiate a traffic in two minutes or three minutes time frame, it holds the notification into the network end, base station end, and only allows it to piggyback it once a transmission is created from your mobile devices. That allows the device not to be on the radio upstate most of the time. With this little, you know, trick, we implemented it. We put it into the co-network part of the, um, you know, like a, of a, a operator network. And what we see that we could, on an average, we could save 15% energy of mobile batteries for average users. For very high end users, those who receive lots of notifications, lots of engaging notifications, for them even you go up to 30 to 40 percent, right? Again, think about from an operator perspective. I tell you, you come to my network, I give you 20 percent battery life. I don't tell you how, but you say it's true. He gives me 20 percent more battery life. So these are little secret sources that, as an operator, you can have for providing better user experience, right? And delaying your notification doesn't hurt, because if somebody retweets your tweet or somebody tags you in Facebook, it can wait two minutes. Of course, we have real-time messages, short messages that we pass through, but for those social network activities or, you know, like something not that important, semantically looking into the application types, we could actually delay that. Good. So this was my first case study where I tried to show you that network can play an important role in designing people content experience by learning behavior. My next one is more about smart object interaction, all these connected things that you see pops up, right? And uh, the, the view is that, you know, they will have a lot of sensors, there will a lot of things for you and so on and so on. So the very first thing I think we need to really talk about that nobody talks about really, that can we actually have a Google for this connected world? You know, that I can find my things and I can find what, what are my things status is. Very simple thing, right? Because this simple search functionality creates opportunity to create many orthogonal services on top of it. Unfortunately, there is no search in a global scale exist simply because of there is no sensor infrastructure that scales globally. You have to have your own tags, you have to have your own things, and blah, 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 all this stuff, which makes things very difficult to scale up, like, uh, you know, infrastructure that we had for the web. I mean, like Google or Yahoo, and so on. So in this particular project, uh, as I said, there are, uh, um, in, the, in the past we learned, um, people have tried to do such things, but it was always small scale, you know, Zigbee or RFID or modes. It, and it never scales up. And lately, you see all these Bluetooth tags coming up by this, um, you know, many startups, right? I mean, one of the startups, for example, called Tiles, which picture I put here. Uh, but this is a problem is they are basically defined by your smartphone range. So if you're just out of your smartphones, they don't work. Or they require cloud sourcing, which is very difficult to scale or to have like a right coverage and so on and so on. So here again, the question is that if an object is connected anyway, in the network, if they have the connectivity, can we actually leverage that connectivity to create a search platform for it? You know, we could find out where the object is and what is the status of this object, simply by looking into its movement in the network, right? Because uh, if, your move, if an object is moving, it's a, you know that it might be in the use stage right now, right? And that's a very common assumption that you can have that inference actually, right? For example, if your vacuum cleaner is moving, you know that you are being, it is being used right now. Um, now, the question is that if, can we actually detect those things? Yes. So in our labs or, you know, in the, in, in the, in the academic world, we have shown that by simply using the network, you could actually understand movement, precise human movement, object movement, um, very carefully. Now, you have to understand there are different layers 
in networking stack. You have Mac layer that gives you maybe a very abstract view of the network, but there is also physical layer that gives you a little bit more information about the, you know, the real signal processing cases. So when you mix up cross-layer approaches, you actually manage to extract very minute movement that happens by an object that are connected to the network. So we applied that techniques. So we created uh, physical things which just have a radio chip in it, nothing else. Simply a radio, a meaning a Wi-Fi radio in it. And then those are being tracked by the home gateways. And then, you know, they are opened up uh, for like a search services and so on. Um, here are a few experience design we have created after that. Uh, just a search experience. For example, you could search for whatever things you have. You can find out where they are right now and what are their states are. You could find out sort of like a timeline view that where are those things where, how many times they were used and so on and so on. You can find sort of like a summer, um, sort of like a summarized view of your, your things, you know. So very mundane services, just like a simple search. When you search for Google something, all it gives you just a list of things, list of pages that matches that keyword, right? It's sim simply like that. But the power is that it scales globally. Everything that has a single radio will work. Okay, and it will create not only the location but also the sort of like the state information by simply looking at its uh, minute movement pattern. And again, we apply both Mac layer and fine layer information to basically deduce that location and the movement information. Um, one question, though, you might ask that what happens about the privacy issue? If, if in, you know, that's a different discussion, we don't have time to go all the way. But what I want to say here that we have taken a very unique approach here is that, for example, in the case of smart home or smart enterprises and so on, if you remember that picture I was showing you, um, you know, um, here that the, all this thing is actually tracked and remain in the home node, meaning like your raw data never leaves your home. The, Application developers, through this query broker in somewhere in the, in, the, in the cloud, come to that home node and can get a, like an aggregated view of the data. The ownership remains at your home or at your enterprise level. So although you're creating this catalog of things, you have to redesign or you have to rethink your data management infrastructure so that, that this you know, privacy doesn't crop up. Um, I have written a lot about privacy issues. Um, I always say, a lot of people don't agree with me, but I always say that we need to monetize our personal data, and that would really make a lot of, lot of uh, no, like a, a buzz go away about these privacy discussions. Uh, I know in the West uh, there is a different view, but I always say that if you include you know, Brazil, China, and India, you can literally have your product you know, at the billion scale. You don't need the other part of the world. Well, you need, they will just follow. You know, and you look into Alibaba, you know what I'm saying. Um, and in that part of the world, really, you know, like if you monetize the privacy, you monetize the personal data, you don't need anything else. Trust me, I'm from that part of the world. You know, give people opportunity, they will give you everything um, out of their life. Good. Um, so that was my second example where I wanted to really show you guys that how you could leverage simple wireless network for creating a unified or universal scaled search platform that will allow you to create orthogonal services on top of it. My final one is more privacy sensitive, but it's also very interesting. It's about people to people interaction. Um, but I, I, I'm pretty sure you're gonna like it. We can have a nice discussion about privacy issues after that, but I think it's, I mean, depending on where you look into it, but it's a very nice technology. Um, so we have a project called Quantified Enterprise where we try to monitor human-to-human -human interactions. We try to monitor how people interact with others. Uh, kind of like a Facebook or a LinkedIn, but in the physical world. So. And we do it by sort of like wearables. So you wear something and we allow people to basically, um, you know, um, be monitored and tracked. Now, 
Tracking people is not new. So in 1992, uh, Andy Hopper from University of Cambridge created this active badge. Um, unfortunately, it didn't work that well because, yes, that privacy thingy. People were really not feeling good to be tracked and monitored in, you know, in their workspaces. And you know, I don't like my bosses looking at actually what I'm doing, how many coffee breaks I'm taking, how many times I'm going to the toilet. You know, I just don't like it. Uh, yeah, that's true. You know, and I think the social perspective, the social norm was different 25 years ago. What happened now, right? So we have this living in so-called like a life of sharing. Everybody tries to share everything of their life, especially if you look into these young generations, the millennial generations. I don't think they can actually resist sharing anymore, right? So, which is, which is, which is, which creates opportunities, right? Which creates opportunities for social scientists to look into human behavior from a different way, to understand how really, uh, as a human being, we could actually interact and behave uh, with each other. Uh, recently, there has been a product from Hitachi called Happiness Badge, which is brilliant. I loved it. I mean, this Japanese crazy thing. I was having a discussion with Chris yesterday that the technology adoption in Japan is so much advanced. What this badge is trying to say, it's not connected. It's sort of like isolated one, but it tries to manage people's stress because in Japan, stress management is a big issue in corporates. And they use accelerometer data and some other proprietary techniques to sort of like detect stress and provide sort of like a feedback to the management about it so that they can take actions. Then there is this nice uh, work by MIT, um, a spin-off, uh, Sociometer Badges, that Sandy Pentland and some of his students started, where they also created this badge where they put a lot of sensors to connect, um, uh, to collect contact information. Uh, and, and, you know, like, and then use services on top of that. You might be asking that, what are the uses of such contact information? Well, actually, there is these two books, um, and there are many works, but especially the one, Social Physics, if you haven't read it, I strongly recommend you to buy it on your way back home or read it. It's a nice book. It will give you a different perspective of how you look into your world around you. In that book, what Sandy actually showed, that by looking into this contact information, you can basically predict the productivity of one third of your team. You can discover natural leaders. And I don't think that it's very hard for us to sort of like a, uh, you know, like a um, hypothesize here that natural leaders have certain qualities in their communication and interaction patterns. You know, they are typically very good in talking, they're very good in interacting with people and making natural connections because that's really important, right? You can deduce or you can detect the early signs by looking into the contact patterns and then you can invest in them so that you know they, they, they become really, really bright leaders for your company and takes your company to the next stages. Also, you can detect happiness, sort of like how people feel and so on and so on by looking into this contact information and I'm gonna show you today a little bit how. And then don't forget the LinkedIn aspect of it, right? I mean, you know, I'm pretty sure everybody here has a LinkedIn account and a LinkedIn profile and everybody uses LinkedIn professionally to connect to each other. But this is a digital world. But if you bring LinkedIn for the physical world, if you work in a big campus like where we work, where 3,000, 5,000 people are in a big campus, you don't know everyone. But knowing people is the key to your personal growth, to your team's growth, to your division's growth, all right? Because really, it makes big difference when you know the right person, because they take decisions and it makes things click, right? So what, um, you know, like uh, uh, the sad part is that when you look into all these different opportunities and if you look into right now what is happening, I talked about, you know, understanding productivity, understanding collaboration, understanding this, you know, LinkedIn aspect of uh, the physical world, understanding happiness and so on and so on. This is a sort of like a new way of looking at the employer and the employee management and the relationship between them, right? But unfortunately, if you look into the current organization, what happens is that, uh, there is this r nice research from Berzin where they show that if you ask large organizations today, 90% uh, of them clearly can sort of like a predict or tell you know, what is the return of investment for the next quarter. But if you ask them what, how much they know about their employees, only 4% can have a sort of like a reasonable answer. And, and that reasonable answer actually comes from these little surveys they do every six months or every quarters about their leaders or about the different managers. You know, different organizations are different, but majority of the cases, this is the case. Now, 
So this sort of like the provided us a kind of like a uh, incentive to look into this quantified enterprise project where we try to understand the contact information between people to people by spontaneous, and this contact information really not the planned meeting. We can understand that by looking into your outlook. No, we are really talking about the spontaneous interaction that happens in the cafeteria, in the coffee area, in the hallways, that people meet a face-to-face -face interaction and have a chat, you know, and you know, like how often they have those things, how frequently actually, and if there's a recurrence pattern in those behavioral patterns and so on and so on. Um, and once you know that, you can provide sort of like a interesting opportunities for multiple skills. For example, the very first stakeholder is the building managers. I mean, it's very obvious, right? If they have a very good spatio-temporal heat map of the people's movement pattern, it will help them to do a bit better, you know, like a maintenance and a more predictive uh, uh, scheduling of their um, workforce and so on. For the employers, it's also important, as I said, that they could learn a lot more about their employees how the employees collaborate, how the employees interact with each other, you know, whether there's a scope of improvement for providing the opportunities to so that they can interact more and so on and so on, discover natural leaders, etc. But the interesting point is what it brings for individual employees, right? What it brings to them. What we really um, found or what we showed that actually there is a quite interesting piece for individuals too because everybody wants to grow. Everybody wants to have the opportunity to grow in the organization, I mean, that's a typical human nature, right? So you could provide these little hints and little opportunities to individuals to interact with different individuals and provide sort of like quantified feedback that allows them to basically have a better opportunities for their personal growth, the growth of their personal network in the company and so on, and to some extent sort of like having a reflection of their behavior in the workplace. Right now we're living in this so-called, you know, like a activity tracker's life, you know, everybody wants to track everything, but that's more like your physical activities, but this is where we're really talking about our workspace activities and so on. So again, we build a system. The system is purely based on no sensors, only a connected uh, device. So we have a smart badge. I have one of that in my bag, I'll show you in a bit, um, which is being tracked by the indoor wireless network infrastructure, in this case Wi-Fi, and then we apply our magical technologies basically to deduce uh, interactions. Uh, the very first one is basically face-to-face -face interaction detection. You know? So what we do, if you know, I mean, I'm talking very um, abstract way here, but I think you will understand, but if you want to know more, I can exp you know, explain later on. When you have the location of two individuals or multiple individuals, you can clearly create a small co-location things, right? That three people are together within one meter or two meter vicinity, five people are together. And then we borrow theories from social science. In social science, human interaction has been defined in many interesting ways. For example, there is two parameters, the size of the group and the duration of the group. And the volatility of the group, which is a combination of these two, is actually quite interesting classical features that you can apply to kind of like a separate, a co-location from face-to-face -face interaction. You know, so there is a face-to-face -face interaction and there are different type of face-to-face -face interaction that two people suddenly meet and then they had a chat for like five minutes and then they go away, two person are talking, then one more person comes in, this kind of stuff, right? So you could apply these social sciences that, you know, we are crossing boundaries here, but when you bring those theories and apply it to a co-location, we actually managed to extract quite good face-to-face -face interaction. And we found that we could actually cover 60% of the uh, interaction that happens in a face-to-face -face way with 90% accuracies, which is, which is basically the first layer for us, for our inference engine. And once we have that face-to-face -face interaction detected, we could actually have a physical network physical social network, but this physical network, the link is really between people to people here, is their f interaction um, intensity, right? That how often, how frequently, how regularity they, they maintain that uh, connectivity link. And once you have that, you know, like a uh, um, affinity graph, you can do crazy things, you know? You can understand one's personality type. You can look into how interactive the person is, by looking into these historical patterns that allows you to basically deduce that a person is ambivert, extrovert, you know, like uh, how, uh, you know, how, how, how he actually behaves. Now, it is true that for enterprise environment, for certain type of job requires you to behave certainly. 
you know, so you need to make that sort of distinction sometimes. But in generally, it gives you a good approximation of how uh, people's personalities are. And then the next thing is more scary, that you can actually deduce a health personal health or mental health of an individual by looking into their physical activity patterns. As I said, that the movement carry minute information about your activity activeness, how active you are, right? And once you have that activeness data and you apply it to the clinical psychology theories together with the personality types, what you really get is how you're feeling today. And I think we all know that when you are sad, you don't want to move much. And there is a basically a very strong correlation, in, in, again, based on clinical psychologists established theories that show that how physical activeness has an impact on mental well-being. Now, you might ask that how accurate it is. Well, it's not that accurate. What we have found is not that we can do it over like 100% accuracy, no? It's like a 60 to 65%, but the good thing is that you do not need to know an individual basis way. You can have a collective view. You can have a, how your team is feeling or how the entire unit is feeling. And when you aggregate different data points, you kind of like a subsume this error that you can have when you look into individual basis. And we are not interested in, you know, per se looking into individual basis, but it's more about the collective uh, health or collective climate in the organization that we are really care about, right? Again, the beauty of this thing is that if I tell you that from network signal I can tell someone's happiness, you will tell me crazy. But I think I just explained to you or opened up that you can basically do this when you look into multi-layer, uh, you know, like a, a, um, um, inference techniques. We build applications on, around it, on top of it. This service is being used in our organization for almost one and a half year now. Uh, we have sort of like an providing the self-quantification that I was providing, by telling you that we can offer how your activities are being, um, you know, what you've been doing in your, act in your office spaces over the last months and quarter and so on. We provide you this face-to-face -face interaction timeline, which is very interesting for this kind of events. Think about it. You meet people, physically meet people, you might forgot to exchange cards, but after a while, you can look into your timeline, you can find people, and you can connect to their LinkedIn or whatever profiles and so on. We, uh, you can have the real-time contacts of your, um, of your network, what today physically uh, on the online world Facebook or LinkedIn does, but here you are really doing on a physical basis. So you can tell me, you know, I know uh, Mike, and Mike knows um, Mark, and they're very good, and Mark is a very important guy, probably the CTO of the company, and I'm sitting here, and he can say, yeah, you can go and talk to Mark, uh, referring Mike, you know, like uh, this kind of thing is actually very important. You know, once you're in the enterprise world, you know that these things are critical for your personal growth and so on. And then, of course, you can have these mundane activities of locating people and colleagues and so on. The last one that I want to really show is actually about the mood or healthness of our saying. So here you see that we basically provide lab scale. We don't even go to the team scale, right? Uh, we don't even want to do that because we have found that you know, through our qualitative studies, there are implications. But when you just try to say that how the lab is feeling today, you know, we, we, we provide you this sort of like feelings that, yeah, lab is very excited or happy or they're very stressed out because president is coming next week. Everybody is like stressed out with the demos and so on and so on. We can have sort of like a nice playful interaction. For example, this is in our office in, in Antwerp where you see this like a mood lamp that changes its color every now and then depending on how the lab is feeling, right? So this is sort of like a more engaging experiences. So we learned three things. I mean, yes, it's true that it is very pr uh, privacy invasive technology, right? But as I said, that we are in a very changing technology landscape, right? So we might have to rethink, you know, what privacy means to us and what we really found that when you give people the right opportunity to personal growth, providing relationship information and relationship recommendation, they're basically willing to provide this little piece of information uh, of their uh, movement in the workplaces that allows them to actually have a better relationship. Um, what we found that they like to have subtle hints, don't really tell people to do what, but provide opportunities that maybe, you know, like, the, you know, this uh, Docker team is in the coffee area and they're having a discussions. Not necessarily you have to mention a specific person, a specific theme all the time. So you have to provide, you have to balance out sort of like the personality of the individual and what sort of personality that individual is and provide recommendation the right way, in a subtle way. And um, as I say, that opportunity at the right time, at the right moment, 
creates a big impact of making people more engaging with these such sort of experiences. Um, now, before I finish, um, I just wanted to say that this is not a crazy view that uh, I'm asking people to wear these badges. So Garner recently predicted that uh, by 2018, um, two million people will be required to wear health and fitness tracking devices as a condition of their employments. And um, I think it's, 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 it's quite all right, you know, like everybody's wearing uh, tracking devices in their bodies these days. Now, if you just have to look into the legislation and the privacy framework and how this data is being used and whether this data is useful. But I think this is not a very radical um, prediction. Uh, we talk, I talked primarily in this last piece, people-to-people -people interaction on a very sensitive, um, sensitive uh, what is it called, uh, domain, enterprise, because enterprise has a lot of issues legislation issues and uh, you know, data protection issues, and people are not comfortable in these things. But the technology that I showed you, by using wireless network to deduce very high level behavioral uh, features of human, is actually quite useful for many other application areas. For example, you might not be interested in paying for knowing the health, mental health of your employees, but you are very interested to pay money to know the mental health of your customers, how the customers feel when they're in the work, uh, in your shop, or retail, or in your whatever you know, a business you are at. You, know, you can do the same thing by providing these kind of badges and you can see that how they interact and kind of like get a sort of like a perceptive feeling about their um, well-being. We just came out of Web Summit last week, or two weeks ago, where we tried to uh, put these badges into some um, investors and uh, startups will actually cover 120 of them. We gave them this little the thing that badge you wear. And uh, we, we managed to found quite interesting, well, we haven't, it's a massive amount of data, so we haven't amount, uh, have the time to look into it yet, everything. But from our little look that we view, it looks very promising that we would be able to wo manage Web Summit, uh, help Web Summit to much, um, uh, to design their you know, like conference experience much better next year. Um, and simply all they had to do is to wear these little badges, which is nothing but just a Wi-Fi chip in it, right? And if you look in the form factor, it just looks like credit card, nothing else. Uh, and this is a huge market space, you know, the conference uh, experience design. Um, you can also think about technologies like this to be used in the kindergartens where small kids can actually wear such thing and your parents, the parents can actually get a report or early signs of autism by comparing that how the kids is behaving in compared to the other kids, and so that you can actually take actions um, uh, in the right time. You can do the same thing for our elderly populations, you know, if they're showing in early signs of depression or so on. And of course, you know, uh, in the clinical psychology, people with bipolar or depression disorders, I mean, this has been currently being used where they have to actually kind of like a log how much uh, interaction they have or how many times they meet an individual and so on and so on. If you automate those things that will actually create nice clinical reports that would help sort of like a, um, you know, um, pr predictive uh, healthcare in a much more useful way. So, to conclude, I basically tried to show you that although wireless network is used as a communication uh, platform or communication fabric, there is other ways of looking to wireless network, Wi-Fi network to be specific, and to design sort of like the experiences in this connected world. Uh, and I, I tried to show you three, exp uh, three examples, people to content, people to object, and people to people interactions. I talked a lot, but this is work of some great people. If you are in the academic world, some of these names are very famous, much more than me. Um, and uh, I would like to thank all of these, uh, my you know, uh, genius team members who actually did this work. Good. Thank you. I would be happy to take some. Yes, uh, let's uh, take a couple of questions. Um, I go around with the microphone because as we're recording, uh, it would be nice if you could use this microphone, please. Yeah, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's a fairly well-known fact that when you measure things, particularly when measurements are used as targets, that people start focusing on the measurements on the targets. It changes their behavior. Have you noticed that, particularly in your last example of the people-to-people -people interactions? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, 
Yes and no. The, the thing is that you need to provide, in this particular case, a long-term feedback of individuals' behavioral patterns, I mean, to monitor sort of like behavioral changes, right? So in that case, yes. If you offer people a feedback of their last one year of experience, interaction experience with different individuals, and try to quantify it in comparison to the rest of the organizations, they do say, I cannot claim that you know, we proved that yes, there is a certain behavior change, but the qualitative studies, again, it's qualitative studies that you have observed, and sort of the quantitative interaction, just by looking at the number of interaction, yes, there are certain peaks where we see that once started people using the service, they started getting feedback, there is a certain change in their number of interaction that happens, for example, before they uh, had this opportunity of getting the feedback, and once they started having the feedback, what is the, there is a certain change you saw. But whether this is um, long lasting or this is an effect of just a new technology introduction and whether this behavior change is actually positive, we still have to verify. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have a question about those emotional uh, statuses uh, you displayed, relaxed and, and happy and so on. Uh, have you uh, have done any measurement whether they are correct uh, and uh, what's the fault tolerance or how much, how so accurate your data is? So there are two things to that. One thing is that the ground truth is um, collected over experience sampling technique, which is basically asking people uh, at a certain point of how they feel through some form, so they can say that I'm feeling happy or good. So what we did is that we put sort of like a tablets in our organization uh, with just uh, basic forms that how you're feeling now or how you, you know. And the particular model we use is a circumplex model, which has four positive motion, uh, emotion and four negative emotion. And we, put, we place that in different locations in the organization so people can actually present that view. Um, and, and then when we did a more controlled evaluation, we actually we tried to uh, go to each individual user every time we, we see a change to verify that whether it was correct or wrong. One last question. I'm coming. One second, one second, one second. You talked about battery life. What's the battery life for this patch if you use Wi-Fi? Uh, good one. <laughs> it, depends, it depends on, on the type of processing you, you would be doing, right? So at this point, what we do is we use Mac layer, so we don't use any TCP on this batch. So we just use Mac layer probes, wireless. If you're familiar with Wi-Fi, you know there is a management frame where in the management frame they send Wi-Fi probes just to say, hey, I'm here, who is my, uh, where is my gateway? So we just use that particular signal. Um, if you send it, this signal every 15 seconds, which is a reasonable uh, window for doing this kind of um, contact information processing, we get about seven days. With with a scheduling in it, meaning you have to uh, turn off the badge after 14 hours. So we assume that if you will have 14 hours maximum in the workplace. So then you can get about a week maximum. Well, thank you very much. Fahim, thank you.